Support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum. Located in Jennings City Hall, the museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is a historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. Additional support provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. I would just ask people not to forget because this is a long way from being over. Uh, they still have needs with specific commodities and we need to pay attention to that. Governor Edwards in Puerto Rico saying Louisiana will partner with the devastated island for as long as it takes to recover from Hurricane Maria. The science behind this is that we want to make sure we're replicating what actually happens in the Mississippi River. A behind the scenes look at the Center for River Studies and why it could become a top Louisiana tourist attraction. Every um, child needs one person who is madly in love with them um, and a stable uh, relationship in their life. Louisiana's children and poverty, the risks they face, and the outreach to help. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Moro. In a moment, much more on the governor's mission of mercy to Puerto Rico, how extreme science could become a tourist destination, and the outreach to our children who need it the most. But right now on the state we're in, the week's other top headlines. ExxonMobil will pay a penalty and improve pollution control at three Baton Rouge plants. It's part of a settlement with federal authorities who accused the company of violating the Clean Air Act. Regulators say the company spewed unlawful amounts of chemicals linked to cancer and smog at eight plants in Louisiana and Texas. Reaction from the Texas branch of Public Citizen condemned the settlement, calling it a slap on the wrist. They say the $2.5 million fine for years of violations is hardly a punishment. They say the fine also proves the EPA isn't serious about enforcing Clean Air Act violations. Dow Chemical in Iberville, West Baton Rouge, and St. Charles Parishes is dedicating $2 billion in new chemical manufacturing investments. New synthetic rubber, plastics plants, and upgraded ethylene capacity and warehousing. Governor John Bell Edwards and Economic Development Secretary Don Pearson hailed the growth as vital for Louisiana's economy and our role in the global marketplace. Dow's operations in Louisiana produced the building blocks for plastics, soaps, detergents, cosmetics, shampoos, pharmaceuticals, and other goods. The governor and NASA officials announced major growth at NASA's Michu Assembly Facility in New Orleans East. This includes ramped up work in the assembly of NASA's Orion Crew capsule and Space Launch System rocket. Boeing leads production of the SLS rocket and Lockheed Martin is the lead contractor for the production of the Orion capsule. Instead of getting $140 million in oil and gas royalties a year to pay for coastal restoration, the Department of the Interior says Louisiana will receive only about half that much. This is from Go Mesa money, the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act. 20 coastal parishes were expecting to split as much as 37 million, but will only get about half that much. If the numbers hold, the state would have to scale back restoration and hurricane protection projects planned for 2019. The drastically lower amount is bad news given the rapid rate of erosion of the state's coastline. Senator Bill Cassidy is having his staff double check the Interior Department's math. The Governor John Bell Edwards and the First Lady returned from Puerto Rico this week. They went at the request of Governor Ricardo Rossello. The a force of workers from Louisiana, GOSEP personnel, disaster management teams, and the National Guard have been there in place for some weeks now. The governor says Louisiana will also be there as long as it's needed. The people in Puerto Rico have been great. I mean, they're very, obviously very resilient people. They're, they're working hard uh, to get back on their feet, uh, and they all are very appreciative for everything that's, that's happening here uh, to help them do that. And, and they, they are thanking all the folks uh, around the United States, and really around the world, uh, who are sending aid in. And, and I guess I would just ask people not to forget, because this is a long way from being over. Uh, they still have needs with specific commodities, and we need to pay attention to that. I was invited to come uh, by Governor Rossello, uh, and he and I 
met uh, a number of months ago and, and actually through the NGA uh, had an opportunity to discuss things that we did in Louisiana after the floods last year. Uh, and so we've actually had a team on the ground. Our best planners have been here uh, for a month now, working with them, especially on the STEP program, uh, but on additional things as they transition to permanent housing as well. And so he invited me to come down and see firsthand what they were experiencing here in Puerto Rico, but also in meetings with him uh, and with the Secretary of Housing here. Uh, we, we've just been able to exchange some ideas uh, you know, and some lessons learned and, and try to get them to incorporate those into their plans and so that they can prepare for a long-term recovery uh, because this, this island, as, you, as you've seen, uh, has sustained an awful lot of damage. We've been here for approximately 30 days. Uh, we've been supporting our Puerto Rican National Guard counterparts at the uh, 125th MP Company. Um, we fall under a greater task force that covers the southern half of the island, but uh, we conducted operations throughout all four task forces, north, uh, south, east, and west. Um, we've done a lot of uh, escorting of, uh, of commodities, uh, supplies at uh, FEMA, brings out to local communities, um, made sure it got from uh, staging areas to distribution points uh, in a lot of the major cities and small towns. We're helping to get housing back up for Puerto Rico after the devastation from Maria. The other was EMAC, the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. We were helping to bring resources from other states into Puerto Rico uh, at their request to help support their recovery and response. But you see, you see these poor people and you see some of the suffering they're going through. So anything that we can do to assist with them, uh, it's just it, it's it's great for them. It's great for Louisiana, and we're just uh, are very proud to be here. Puerto Rico's Power Authority has now sent a letter to U.S. mainland utilities requesting help to restore power. This comes in the hours after the island canceled a contract with Whitefish Energy Holdings. They're depending on the U.S. consortium of utilities to help now. The Edison Electric Institute, a utility industry trade group, is working on logistics of mobilizing crews, equipment, and experts. Energy Louisiana is also in talks to see how it can support this effort. More than a third of Louisiana children under the age of five live in poverty. A new report from the Department of Health and from Tulane University looks into child well-being across the state. LPB's Kelly Spires here with more on that. Kelly. That's right. Um, it measures 12 different indicators that have to do with a child's education, health, or economic stability at a parish-wide parish level. Let's take a look. Relationships are key to early childhood development. When there's a strain on those relationships, that can affect a child's growth and set them back for a lifetime. Kids learn through relationship. And so if there is strain that's happening in an individual family because of unemployment, because of uh, uh, income insecurity, or because of lack of access to um, high quality care, those things then impact the child's development. Amy Zapata is with the Department of Health, which put together the Louisiana Early Childhood Risk and Reach Report. If um, there is strain and stress and community violence or partner, or partner violence or violence that's happening in the home, things that are per, per, prolonged stress, that really impacts, um, really, it's kind of interesting at a biological level, at the really a cellular level, um, but then also what they're calling the architecture of the child's brain. The report measures things that could lead to this kind of stress. For every parish, the report tallies up these economic indicators. Unemployment rates, the percent of single mothers, percent of mothers who dropped out of high school, percent of children under five living in poverty, and the median income compared to the federal poverty level. The worst off parishes are in the state's Delta region. East Carroll and Madison parishes, for example, ranked as high risk for all five of these indicators. As far as health measures, the report looked at low birth weight, teen birth rate, infant mortality, uninsured children under six, and child maltreatment. Two thirds of parishes were high risk for at least one of these indicators. It makes it hard for parents to be able to engage with a child if they're feeling strained and stressed themselves and insecure. Um, and so all of these factors, you can start to see how they, they might, you, uh, you think early childhood, you might think of just child care or early care and education, um, but it's really all of these different factors that are happening in the context of relationships and in the context of where kids and families live, learn, work, and play. Education benchmarks include pre-literacy at kindergarten and the percent in publicly funded pre-K or a similar program.
Parishes are evenly split between those that are low and low moderate risk and those that are moderate high and high risk. However, high risk parishes tend to be lower populated. That means that about a third of children under five live in those higher risk parishes. This report is not intended to look at the individual risk factors for any given child. It is what is happening in the context of communities and for people to, to, um, and to identify communities where the kids may be in more trouble than in other areas. And in some ways, even a parish level feels too big. Cameron is the only parish without an indicator that falls into the high risk category. And that could be because of a statistical quirk resulting from low population. That means every parish has something to work on. If you then look at even at a, at a smaller level that we can't measure of what's happening in individual neighborhoods and in communities, it's just giving a signal that you have children um, who are living in communities that need additional support, their families need support, and it's connecting both, again, the health, education, and economic indicators tying together. The report also measured some of the programs the state has to help parents and children. Zapata calls them buffers. Every um, child needs one person who is madly in love with them um, and a stable uh, relationship in their life. Um, and, um, and that can then buffer you against the different strains that are happening in your home or in a, in a community. Um, and so um, as we look at the education um, indicators, the health indicators, um, and the economic indicators, my hope is that with a report like this, people are really looking across sectors of what they can do to contribute. Some programs help educate mothers, while others provide childcare. Just over half of Louisiana's parishes have between 40 and 60 percent of children ages three or four enrolled in publicly funded pre-K. 26 percent of parishes have between 20 and 40 percent enrolled. Four parishes have more than 70 percent enrolled. Three are moderate high or high risk. I think that what the data are showing, it's a, it's a look. Um, it's to see where there is balance um, and how big is the gap between what's available and what's needed. And I think that's really where it becomes important for other sectors to look how is it that they can help bolster that system uh, overall. Zapata hopes the report will better inform policy and funding decisions and the distribution of resources. And there may be renewed interest from the business community in supporting early childhood education and care. Another new report recently found that the state's economy loses over $1 billion annually due to parents leaving work for child care. To find some of the state's resources for new mothers and early childhood, you can visit the website partnersforfamilyhealth.org. The operation of one of the world's largest physical models of the Mississippi River is helping scientists find out what works in the real world in the ongoing battle to keep Louisiana coastal areas from vanishing. It just so happens the LSU Center for River Studies could also become a major tourist destination, aside from being a cutting edge scientific learning tool. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to educate the public not just about what good science and engineering research we're doing at LSU, but also to educate the public about what you know, re relevant science and engineering we're doing at LSU. What has Dr. Clint Wilson, the director of the LSU Center for River Studies, all excited is what's going on inside this building on the water campus adjacent to downtown Baton Rouge. My first impression was that I'd entered a cutting-edge science museum that focuses on the importance of the chief river on the North American continent. I quickly found out that it is much more. So we're looking at a physical model of the lower Mississippi River. Rudy Simino is project manager of the CPRA, Louisiana's Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority. The CPRA works in partnership with LSU to showcase this model of Louisiana's working Mississippi River Delta. Based on the exact parameters of the river's physical and dynamic properties, the model will replicate the flow of sediment and water through 14,000 square miles of southeast Louisiana, or from Donaldsonville to the mouth of the Mississippi. In this particular instance, this object happens to be the lower Mississippi River. Physical models were built for things like ship hulls or airplane wings and other types of features. Our object here is the Mississippi River. Our modification 
is how the Mississippi River responds to modifications in the form of sediment diversion. So we want to reconnect the Mississippi River to the basins that are losing massive amounts of wetlands. We had survey data taken from all over the coast, four, over four billion points of data. We, we made a massive 3D file. We put it in a computer and we have a computer controlled router that routed 216 panels. You can't really see them now because they're glued together and grouted really well, but this model is actually a 216 piece puzzle, a giant puzzle that was actually glued together. And each of those puzzle pieces, they're five by 10 foam panels, high density foam panels. They were routed with this router 216 times. This ghostly appearance of the model you see is before all the bells and whistles are applied to bring it to life. We're going to um, actually work with LSU to operate this model and the technicians will actually uh, run sediment and water. That sediment is a ground plastic, it's black. So at some point we're going to inject sediment onto this model and you're going to see a, a black riverbed uh, from north to south. And then we're going to open a diversion eventually, then you're going to see a black mini delta be built. That's the science side of it. Now communications wise, um, a lot of people who visit this model or even visit our coast can't really get a feel for what they're looking at. You and I have been around here for a while. We can look at this and see New Orleans. We can see Grand Isle. However, a lot of visitors don't have that luxury. So we actually have a projection system on the ceiling as well. And we're gonna project down on it in the most simplest form, a map, aerial photography, Google Earth, uh, whatever you'd like to call it. And that, that way it would give visitors a perspective of what they're looking at here. In addition to just that map, we can really bring in master plan projects or uh, hurricane paths or flood prediction models. Anything that basically we can use computers to visualize, we can actually visualize on this big white canvas. So there's the science side and there's the communication side and that's what the projectors speak to. The point of all this and of the water campus in general is the epic battle to keep Louisiana from washing away, some 1900 square miles lost since the early 1930s. Water is not just life-sustaining in the traditional sense. From agriculture to trade routes, water is an integral part of our society, given its environmental and economic impact, as well as its importance in local culture and communities. And that's where the mission of the Water Institute of the Gulf begins, reaching the perfect balance. The Institute is tasked with developing innovative science and engineering strategies to inform policymakers and natural resource managers. It will also provide tools to keep resilient coastal and deltaic communities vital under the constant pressure of growing water management challenges. Well, we see a lot of these. Right. What, what is this right here? Yeah, so those are acoustic sensors. So they're used to measure the water level in the river. So as we you know, change the flows in the, our model river, or we change the amount of sediment we put in there, we're using those to look at what the water levels are in the river. They're also located, those gauges are located at the same location the Corps of Engineers has measures water levels in the Mississippi River. So what so we, we see here is an actual place in the real life. That's correct. That's correct, because part of you know the, the science behind this is that we want to make sure we're replicating what actually happens in the Mississippi River. This massive working scale model is an enormous teaching tool. Number one is it allows us to do long-term research, long-term experiments under very controlled conditions. So we can look at different scenarios, we can look at different operating strategies and how the river will respond and, you know, in terms of the water levels, in terms of the sediment. Um, number two, I think it provides a wonderful outreach education opportunity. There's really nothing better than having somebody see the water flow, see our model sediment move, and you know that sediment is designed to replicate the Mississippi River sand. So when someone comes out and sees the water going, you know, going up and down with the seasons, to see the flow rates going up and down, to see the sediment move, it really provides a, a very kind of not hands-on but kind of eye-opening um, way to to show them, you know, what we're trying to do with the river, why we're trying to do certain strategies, and what the efforts are. We went through, the design team went through and figured out based upon the scale of the model, the horizontal and the vertical scales, based upon what the flow rates are in the Mississippi River, what the water levels are in the Mississippi River. We can go through and through some calculations, we can determine how much water do we need to put into our model river that replicates a certain amount of water in the Mississippi River. 
And then we can do the same thing with the sediment. We know a certain amount of sediment at certain times of the year goes down the Mississippi River. Again, we use the pumps and the system to put the appropriate amount of sediment into our model river. And that information comes from the it actual comes from the sediment actual, that is going the down the river. The actual flow and sediment that comes down the river. And then we can use measure the water levels in our river, and we can also me measure how much sediment we have to dredge out of the river, and we can compare those to what the Corps of Engineers amazing. and others actually measure on a daily basis. It's an amazing learning it tool. Is. The price tag on the Center for River Studies, $18 million. It will open to the public early next year. They can take visitors in groups of 75 at one time. Hey, there's a major honor to tell you about for the Festival International in Lafayette. The annual event and program director, Lisa Stafford, had been presented with the Knight of the Order of Arts and Letters by the French Minister of Culture, saying that the festival is known around the world, demonstrating a vitality of French culture and heritage in Louisiana. The 2018 festival will happen April 25th through 28th in downtown Lafayette. They draw as many as 400,000 people a year. Now from our Louisiana treasures comes the Alexandria Museum of Art, positioned in the heart of central Louisiana. The architecture of the museum is a blend of contemporary and historical. And as you'll see, the museum features a magnificent permanent collection and is also host to national and international exhibits. Here's Catherine Pierce telling us about it. The Alexandria Museum of Art is a fine art museum. Our collection scope is modern and contemporary Louisiana, Southern, and American artists in that order of importance. In 1998, they did a capital campaign called The Jewel on the Red, and they raised the money to build this modern addition onto the historic bank building that had been the museum previously. So now our building is a beautiful combination of a historic building and a modern contemporary building, kind of like our collection that starts at early 20th century and comes right into contemporary artwork. We've been celebrating the 40th anniversary this year, and one of the ways that we've been celebrating it is we're putting in our first permanent collection gallery that'll be installed on the third floor. Our museum has about 4,300 square feet of exhibition space, half in the third floor galleries and half on the first floor galleries. When we started investigating the collection, the very first pieces that were accessioned in the collection, one was a piece by Rodrigue called Steamboat, another was a piece by a local art educator. So we knew that education was important to those people who founded this museum. A few years back, uh, our school system here, Bolton High School, discovered that they had these two paintings that had been hanging in the library forever, and as it turned out, they were paintings by Ellsworth Woodward, one of the founders of Louisiana Art, uh, who started the Newcomb School of Art at Tulane um, in the early part of that century. And so we hold those pieces and they're very precious to us. Recently we purchased a work by Michaelopoulos. He had donated a piece to us, but we recently purchased a work that's from his early works that's signed by his name Mitchell. Now he didn't start as a Mitchell. They came as Michaelopoulos to America. They Americanized their name to Mitchell, and after he became an artist, he went back to his original name. Um, of course, we have works by Clementine Hunter. Our museum is close to Melrose, and uh, we have several of her works in the collection, as well as um, some other self-taught artists. That story can be found in our Louisiana Digital Media Archives. Crawfish Aquatics in Baton Rouge is hosting its Water Safety Day Friday, November 10th. November is Water Safety Month, and the school is fulfilling its mission to spread water safety awareness and education in the Capital City region year-round. Crawfish Aquatics tells me they plan to spread this program, though, to the entire state. For more info, you can contact swimschool at crawfishaquatics.com. It's a happy 50th anniversary to Public Broadcasting Act of 1967, signed by then President Lyndon Johnson. It gave birth to non-commercial broadcasting in the U.S., and it's why we're on the air, bringing this program to you right now. LPB signed on in 1975, and uh, of course, Louisiana, the state we're in, in 1976. A reminder for you, this weekend it is time to fall back Set your clocks back before you go to bed Saturday night as daylight saving time begins Sunday morning at 2 a.m. We get that extra hour of sleep 
with the time change. And that is our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB on demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows as well as other Louisiana programs that you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook as well. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter and visit lpb.org where you can view more stories and leave us a comment. This program is available on DVD. Support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum. Located in Jennings City Hall, the museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is a historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. Additional support provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you.